I want to talk commodities. Your corn and wheat ETFs, they've seen huge inflows in the past few months. Uh, explain to us how they work. I always want to review these futures ETFs, these commodity ETFs. They have futures contracts. They have different expiration dates, correct? Just walk us through this. That's right. When money comes into the fund, we buy three different futures contracts in each fund. Um, we never buy spot. We're always letting people participate what they call along the curve of futures. So essentially, if you think the price of the commodity will go up, you buy the fund and those, those futures contracts go up. The right. fund does what those futures contracts do, up or down, and it allows you to participate in that price movement uh, by trading the ETF. Okay, so you have made the point, Sal, uh, that Ukraine is a very important support, uh, source of supply uh, for corn, and this is a critical moment uh, for the global corn harvest. Uh, your corn ETF just hit a seven-year high. Uh, why is this a critical moment uh, for corn? It's critical because it's corn planting season in the northern hemisphere. And Ukraine, which is a major exporter of corn, uh, the, the planting is interrupted, obviously. So what we've got are, are two things. Ukrainian farmers, we don't know how much corn they can plant. And if that corn isn't planted, it won't exist at all. And they're a major exporter of corn. They're about uh, between 14 and 16 percent of global corn exports come out of Ukraine. If they don't plant it, they won't have it to export. That could be a big issue. And um, we've got corn growing and about to be harvested in Brazil in the southern hemisphere, and we'll see how that goes, because that's what can replace it right now. U.S. and Ukrainian farmers are just now starting to plant. And you've also made a very good point to me that Russia is the largest exporter of fertilizer in the world. And if you have less fertilizer out there, well, you have a lower yield on corn here. Um, let me just ask you one other point you made here. Uh, Russia is the world's largest exporter uh, of fertilizer. I mentioned that as well. Uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, about what's going on with wheat right now. And I, I think... What's very important here about wheat here uh, is the Ukraine is an important source of that as well. This gets harvested in June. Wheat gets harvested. What's the outlook right now for that? Well, the outlook is, again, you're right. The wheat it is planted in the autumn. It grows uh, now. It, it wakes up after winter and it grows. It should be fertilized now so that fertilizer disrupting new reactions could have a problem, um, could, could have a, a, a problematic effect on the growth of wheat in the Ukraine. But the wheat is there, it's growing. Will they be able to harvest it? That's the big question. Harvest season is late June and July. Uh, if they can't harvest it, they can't export it. Could be an issue. Ukrainian government is saying about 50% uh, of their wheat exports may be inhibited or lost completely. And that's that's a bigger problem for the world as we move forward here, because those, those inventories being trapped are gonna cause the supply disruptions for global wheat. Brian, I know you don't run the uh, commodities desk for J.P. Morgan, but they have an enormous commodities uh, division as well here. Um, can you summarize what, what J.P. Yeah. Morgan or your thinking is on commodities? Yeah, well, and, and I'd add a, a little bit different angle to what, what Sal has talked about. So if we think about the ETF space, $7 trillion of assets invested there, and actually all, overall commodity ETFs have seen outsized inflows year to date to the tune of about $20 billion. What I'm seeing there is that's investors that are preparing their portfolio, portfolio for an inflationary environment commodities can participate positively in an inflationary environment. So that's what investors are doing. Yeah, I think that's an important point. So now, Sal, uh, let's just talk about the sort of broad picture story here. What effect has this war and COVID had on the global commodity market? So, you know, we always talk about globalization, uh, and it's been a very real phenomenon for commodities, too. Commodities have benefited from globalization. Uh, what does less globalization, for example, mean for commodities right now? I think things get hurt because all the global supply chains have been disrupted, and not just the specifics of wheat and corn exports out of Russia and Ukraine. It's more no one can count on their supplies anymore. And so people got used to operating just in time. If you used you know, 10,000 tons of copper a month, you knew it would come every 30 days and you, you didn't have any excess inventory. I think that that model is disrupted now across all commodities. And so people are going to hoard. They're going to have to at least accumulate inventories to build in anticipated supply disruptions, which means the demand for commodities is actually a little bit higher, not for the actual use, but because people can't count on steady supplies, so they need to buy what they need this month, plus buy what they need to store in case they don't get their shipments next month. So I think the global dis disruption of supply chains is, is probably the biggest ripple effect out here from the world.
Okay, so the bad news is we've got com in commodity inflation, uh, uh, and it's going to be longer lived because of hoarding. But what about the other side of that? Uh, it could higher prices spur more innovation, for example. I mean, that, it, why wouldn't that happen? Uh, it will. It just takes time. I think that, you know, the, the old adage that higher prices get rid of high prices is true because, you know, in the case of farmers, everyone will plant. It takes one season for every farmer to plant and get more crops if, if they're able to plant. Uh, it takes a long time to drill an oil well and even longer time to build a mine. And so the longer prices stay high, the more motivated people are to produce, the more innovation comes. Things will be invented, ways to produce that we don't even know yet. And that will happen. So over time, what the good that can come out of this is that it will spur innovation, it will spur more production. It's hard to believe now, but there'll be more of each and every commodity we're talking about than there ever was before a few years from now. What do you buy on? Uh, that makes sense what he's saying to me. An agricultural revolution happened 50 years ago. Why couldn't we have another, you know, leg up in the agricultural revolution? I, I, I totally agree, but I think there's going to be a lag in time between when that can come online and what we're dealing with today. Um, and that's going to take a little bit of time to figure, figure yeah. out.